Anyway, um, yesterday what we did was to try and convert the Klein Gordon field into its modes QK and then so we started with phi of T and X and we basically expanded it over K. And then we found that Q K of T described infinitely many decoupled simple harmonic oscillators. <coughs> and these oscillators have operators like this associated with them which raise and lower the energy. This is finally booting. And then we said well the state with lowest energy should be this for all k. And we gave a physical interpretation that this state is the vacuum. And this is the very key property of field theory that in field theory all excitations of the system are built above the vacuum. The vacuum is the lowest excitation. It's, an ex it's, it's a state in which there is nothing. Hmm. Now we'll see in a lecture or two that when you have interactions that's not quite true. The vacuum is not so empty as we might think. Hmm? But when we have a non-interacting system and we can solve it like this then the vacuum is really empty. And then states are of the form doesn't, doesn't matter at all which way I write these indices <coughs> and these have the correct energy and momentum to be multiparticle states And from the fact that for one chosen set of momenta k1 up to kn, there is only one state, not many states. So we deduce that these particles are spinless. And from the fact that we can permute the order of these a daggers, we also deduce that they satisfy both statistics. So these must be spinless bosons. Now, how many spinless bosons do we know of in nature? One and that is the Higgs and we haven't found it yet. Hmm. So we have to admit that we have chosen possibly the most unfamiliar type of field to quantize because we don't have much experimental basis as yet for such a field. Hmm. But the reason we have done it which I hope it's clear to all of you is that it's simpler because if it's spinless then all the complications due to spin are simply not there. Hmm? So nature unfortunately didn't decide to spare us that trouble and in fact as you know the vast majority of particles in nature are actually spin half fermions that is all the quarks and leptons. In addition there are a few which are spin one including the photon and all of those have some complications which we'll have to address but not today. Okay. Now let me uh, wrote yesterday was summation over all k like this and this summation as you know is over set of discrete values which are the in integers m1, m2, m3 occurring in k, all those integers just go from minus to plus infinity. The reason they were integers is that we were in a box. 
So now, let's take the box size to be infinite. That box didn't really exist. It was something to make the system more easy to deal with. So let's imagine that the box has gone to infinity. Then what do we really expect? That these k's will become continuous. Then any k is allowed simply. And we have to integrate over all of them. So we expect that the sum will turn into an integral. The conventional normalization of that integral is by with a 2 pi cubed. And then here we simply have h bar omega k. The same things. If you prefer now you can think of these as arguments rather than labels. It's just how you write it. Hmm? The same thing exactly. Except that it's now written as an integral. Okay. Now <coughs> once it's an integral then the commutation relation a k a minus k prime dagger. Earlier this was Kronecker delta of k and k prime. So now it should be some something which uses the fact that k and k prime are continuous. So in fact it will be again this normalization comes in and delta 3 the Dirac delta of k minus k prime. So this is a straightforward extension of the formulae that we had now to the limit of infinite volume. From now on we will work always in this limit. So now our box is gone. We won't use that box anymore. Okay. Now let us recall that after doing all this everything is nicely expressed in terms of a's and a daggers but we have somehow forgotten about phi. We made its mode expansion and then we forgot about it. So let us bring it back. So let us recall that phi of t and x. Okay, in this process also we should remember that now everything is continuous. So phi will be an integral just like these are integrals. So it will be integral d3k over 2 pi cubed qk And of course we know the qk in terms of a and a dagger. So the precise relation between qk and a and a dagger is that it is just the sum a k plus a dagger minus k with some normalization. So we can put this back there. And we get that phi of t and x is say uh, 1 over root. Let's just write it like this t3k. So now we have written the original Klein-Gordon field in terms of this <coughs> and in this form we can see that phi is real because if you take the dagger on this side this will change to minus and this will become uh, a k will change to a k dagger and this will change to a minus k then you make a flip of k to minus k because it is a dummy variable and you are back where you started. So you see that phi is real. Now there is another way to write it which is to flip k in the second term and this makes it easier, a bit easier to remember as well. So continuing from that expression, the last one there, we can write The 
So first term I will write as it is. But for the second term, I write it like this. Is that okay? In the second term alone, I have just flipped k to minus k since it's a dummy variable. Okay. The advantage of it is that now inside the integral we only have a k and a dagger k, both with k, but then the exponents have opposite signs. Okay. Now remember that corresponding to that QK there was also a PK. PK was the canonical momentum and PK was also given in terms of A and A dagger and here I have to get my signs and factors right. So it was minus I K minus A dagger minus K <coughs> so we had a PK which is canonical conjugate to QK but we don't seem to have anything that's conjugate to Phi okay in the oscillator system Q and P were canonically conjugate coordinates and momenta Phi is made out of Q, Phi is nothing but Q converted into position space if you like. So there must be some corresponding momentum type of variable which will be a field momentum. This is a new concept but it is easy to guess what it should be because we just define Pi of T and X by analogy with uh, the top line over there as integral D3 K over 2 pi cube pk hmm, e to the ik dot x and next I simply have to plug in that pk is all this and I will get some expression for phi minus i upon this square root plus the integral So the idea is we substituted PK in there and then again we made that flip of the second term by sending K to minus K. Hmm? So then we got this form. So this is called the canonically conjugate field momentum. So here is a good moment to pause and think what is going on. You see phi is a field, phi is not a coordinate of any place, phi is not a distance or a measure of some length or location of some object. Hmm? If phi is equal to 2 or phi is equal to 10 it does not mean I am here and I'm, or I am there. Phi is a field, okay? its excitations carry energy. Hmm? But when I decompose it in modes qk then the qk behave like generalized coordinates. They are not real coordinates of any physical space. Hmm. However, in classical mechanics we would have learnt that any kind of coordinates are equally good coordinates. That's why we use the word generalized coordinates. They don't have to apply to space. Sometimes coordinates can be angles, sometimes they can be some other thing. Hmm. So these are to be treated in that way. But generalized coordinates always have a conjugate generalized momentum because of that the field also has a conjugate generalized momentum. This is not again physical momentum in the sense of m times v or anything. It is just the conjugate variable to the field variable phi. So phi and pi come in a pair just like q and p come in a pair. 
we will see that it's useful for various things. <coughs> now, the key thing that we can now show is the following. Let's calculate the commutator of the operator phi of t n x and pi of t n x prime. Why are we doing this? Well, here's phi, here's pi. Hmm. Now, the label x on phi is analogous to the label k on q. Okay. While the time dependence is inside, but x is like a label. Remember, this q is also q, is really q of t. These are all functions of t, of time. Hmm. So, when I write a commutator bracket, q comma p is i h bar, it is really q at k and p of k prime, both at the same time, commutator, that is i h bar. So, let me try the same thing on this and see what I get on the right hand side. And we will see in a moment that again we get the natural thing that we expect. In fact, let me first write it. I h bar, then maybe some 2 pi's, no, uh, no 2 pi's, hopefully, just delta 3 of x minus x prime. These are vec 3 vectors. The point is, we did not have to assume this because both phi and pi are given in terms of A and A dagger and we already know what is the commutator of all possible A's with A daggers. So, it is a few lines calculation to arrive at this result. Yes. Yeah, uh, different people use different conventions, but perhaps I should use 3 by 2, I am not 100 percent sure. Uh, on what basis are you saying that? Yeah. 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 Please. Different people do different things. For example, if your momentum eigenstate, or for that matter, the computer A A dagger is normalized just to a delta function. Right. Then you end up getting a two pi to the power three by two square root of two h cross omega k. Okay. On the other hand, if A A dagger is normalized to two by two times two omega k delta function, then you end up getting what he is saying. Hmm. Two times energy hmm. without a square. Okay. Uh, so there is a whole lot of you have yeah. which is intermediate No, no, but is it consistent? See, all possible conventions are allowed as long as they are internally consistent. They are consistent. For example, if your uh. A A dagger commutator, hmm. that two by two was not there, uh. so you end up with the two by two power three. Three by two, which is what he wants. Right, right. So let me actually st uh, pause and make a little comment about conventions. See, uh, it is one of the biggest problems in physics to get the convention straight. You have seen already that in two and a half lectures, more or less, I am um, not sure at any given moment what conventions I am using. Hmm? Now, the point is that you need to use con conventions which are consistent, but you do not need to always use the same conventions in your life. It can happen, let us say, in fact, it will happen, um, probably will happen to you next week. There is a course on general relativity. Anybody who teaches general relativity will take the metric of flat space time to be minus plus 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 while I have taken plus minus minus minus. Okay? Now, uh, if you are stuck with one or the other then you can either be particle physicist or relativist but you can never do both. That seems like a big shame. Hmm? So, therefore what we do is we try to move back and forth between these two conventions. We basically say okay, it is like a language you know. Today people are speaking Hindi, okay, I will speak Hindi, tomorrow they are speaking Marathi, I will speak Marathi. The more languages you can speak, better for you. If you can't, okay, then you are restricted. Hmm. But the important thing is, you can't use one set of conventions on page 1 of your calculation and then switch to the other set on page 2 of your calculation. That you cannot do. Hmm. That is what one has to be very alert about. Therefore, if something here does not look right to you because it is not agreeing with your book, that is not a very good reason, but it, it might be that you say, well, this does not look right because of the normalization you assumed for A with A dagger as he said. Hmm? That is possibly a problem. Now, he has assured me that it is that I am actually okay, but internally the conventions have to be consistent. That means compared with what I did earlier, this has to be consistent. Hmm? And if I have got wrong or inconsistent conventions, then probably you will not get this answer. So, this answer will be a test of the convention. PK probably has the square root upstairs. Yeah, it must have. Thank you.
Thank you. Good. Very good. Now I feel much happier. Minus I. This is correct. Because without this, there is no chance that PK with QK will be 1, right? PK with that QK has to be 1. Now, uh, 1 might be... So, the factor, there could be a factor of 2 as well. I hope, hopefully, there is not a factor of 2. Probably, it is okay. But at least, these factors better cancel. So, this is what PK should be. Therefore, pi, which is this, should have this upstairs minus i into square root 2 h bar omega k. Good. Then I think I am through. And then this should be true. In the worst case, I may also have a factor of 2 wrong somewhere. But apart from that, this is correct. Okay. So, this is a very famous relation in the box. And as we will see possibly later today, Instead of doing all that I have done, you could have just directly gone to this using the Lagrangian formalism for fields, which many field theory textbooks do. Unfortunately, I find that very untransparent because it is much easier to think of energy levels when you have oscillators rather than when you have fields. So, we went to another language which helped us, this language of A and A dagger, which helped us to derive the energy spectrum of the theory. But if you just want a formal relation which tells us that this field is quantized, then this is that relation. Hmm. A field or any variable is quantized when it and its canonical conjugate momentum have a non-zero commutator proportional to h bar. So, this equal time commutation relation has the effect of quantizing the field. So, it quantizes the field. So, once we have this, then we are sure that we are doing quantum field theory and not classical field theory. Let's yeah. Sure. When you have pi h bar 1, yes. then you get a representation for p as minus i yes. h bar del by del. Same is true here. Yes, yes. Exactly the same. Pi is just del. It's the functional derivative with respect to pi. That's correct. It's exactly the same. And in fact, based, it's based on that that the Hamiltonian formalism in field theory is done and wave functions are constructed. Just that uh, after some point that uh, runs out because there is not too much you can do. I guess one important point here is that look at the harmonic oscillator. It is actually useful and good system in ordinary mechanics and it is exactly solvable. Hmm? Many problems actually reduce to that. But look at the analog of that here is free field theory. It is a completely useless theory. It does not describe anything in physics. Because we don't have free particles, we have interacting particles. Hmm? So, with, with harmonic oscillator, you can do many things. All those things you can do with free field theory. But interacting field theory is so much more difficult that uh, this, somehow these methods are not very useful. They are useful actually, but not very useful. Okay, good. Okay. Sir, yes. Why this Yeah, first of all, uh, this is derived, this is not assumed. This relation follows from AK, AK dagger equals 1. And that relation follows from Q, P equals IH bar. And that one we postulated because Q is a generalized coordinate and we always quantize coordinates by Q, P equals IH bar. Hmm? Are you seeing that at every step everything is linear? Q is a linear combination of A and A dagger. Hmm? Phi is a linear combination of Qs. Therefore, phi is a linear combination of A and A dagger. Hmm. Pi is also a linear combination of A and A dagger. So, when you take the commutator, this A and this A dagger will give me a commutation of 1. Okay. And therefore, I have another problem with my conventions. Help. How am I going to... No, no, how do I get h bar and the end? The h bar seems to drop out between this and that. Powers of h bar. Uh, Sorry? Because yeah. The pi and pi dot have an h bar square in your convention. Pi and? Pi dot. Yeah. And you don't have h bar. Ah, pi and pi dot have a relative factor of h bar. Good. Okay. Okay. Tutor. That's a job for the tutorial. Hopefully, there's one more h bar somewhere.
Very soon we'll set H bar equals one, so at least one set of difficulties will go away. But I think I made my point that it's not completely easy to keep track of H bar. Okay. Now, let me make a brief comment about normalization. Let's look at the one particle state A K dagger on zero. Okay. How would we normalize this? Well, as it is, if I take its so this is like this is the ket state, okay, its adjoint state would be zero pointing to the left and the dagger of a k dagger which is just a k. Okay. Now if I take the inner product between a pair of these arbitrary pairs then it would be 0 a k a dagger k prime 0. Because I pick an arbitrary k here and different one here. Now this is easy to calculate. You know how to calculate this. Hmm? You just use the commutator and the difference is the term in the reverse order which is 0 because A kills when it acts to the right and A dagger kills when it acts to the left. So this can be replaced by the commutator. So this would come out to be 2 pi cube delta 3 k minus k prime. Hmm. Now there is a problem with 2 pi 3 delta 3k minus k prime because remember this is supposed to be a one particle state. Hmm? This is the norm of the one particle state. Now all this time we have happily been working in a formalism which does not uh, explicitly take account of special relativity though we are trying to do relativistic field theory. Okay, Because in this formula you see k3 vector appearing all the time but by a Lorentz boost k3 vector gets mixed with k0 component right? because Lorentz boost mixes space and time components. So this thing is certainly not Lorentz invariant. You could say that most of the formula I have been writing have been not Lorentz invariant but this one would be serious because this is an inner product so it is a scalar quantity it's no longer an operator just a number. And this is a number that we might be able to measure or compare with something and it doesn't look nice for it to be non-Lorentz invariant. So we change our definition slightly in such a way that the normalization is Lorentz invariant. It will be a number but it's not invariant. It's not? Huh? On the left hand side also not invariant. Yeah, it's not invariant. It's a number. Yeah. That right. Is, uh, it's a three. It's a three scale. It's a yeah. No, but my point is though, it, from the quantum mechanical point, it's a scalar in the sense this is a vector, this is an operator. All that quantum mechanical stuff has gone. It's a C number, hmm. but it's not a proper Lorentz scalar. That's correct. But we can get one, and that's much more convenient. And to get that, we notice the following point, which is that supposing we make a boost. x1. Okay. Then as I showed you yesterday, only the 0 and 1 components will change, the 2 and 3 components will not change, so we forget about those. Okay. And the way the 0 and 1 components change is that k0 prime and k1 prime are given as some parameter associated to the boost which is related to the boost velocity. Okay. Now why do I say delta 3 is not invariant? So what is delta 3? It contains delta of k1 minus k1 prime times delta of k2 minus k2 prime times delta of k3 minus k3 prime. So the last two factors I can forget about those are invariant. 
because K2 and oh, there are too many primes in this problem. Ah, uh -huh, this is very bad. Uh, what? I think this one better be, let's do this as K, let's call this vector L. Okay? This is better. Okay, so K, K2 minus L2 and K3 minus L3 don't change at all. Only K1 minus L1 changes. Okay, and how does it change? By these. So, K1 prime minus L1 prime is equal to, so I write this factor and it's sine hyperbolic alpha K0 minus L0 plus cos alpha K1 minus L1. So, this is the statement that it's not invariant because delta of this is not the same as delta of this, right? So this is the problem. However, there is a rather beautiful relation which is that delta of this stuff, all this, can be shown and this is a something you can do in the tutorial, is omega So, 
what I promised you that for some time we will forget about Lorentz invariant and the invariance and then we will start to see that it is really there. Uh, when I started to talk about phi in the language of mode expansion, I wrote phi t and x is equal to integral qk of t to the i k dot x. And this already tricks t and x on different footing. I made the expansion in functions of x, but at this stage I don't know what is q of t. Okay, q is some function of t, but what function is it of t? Unless you tell me that, I can't tell you what function is phi of t. Right. Now, of course, as a classical function, we can easily find it out because it's a harmonic oscillator. The classical solution is sine omega t or cos omega t, and we can put that in. But we are in quantum mechanics and we want to know the time evolution of the quantum operator phi of t and x. And there is a standard procedure in quantum mechanics for finding time evolution, which is to say that any operator in quantum mechanics at time t, this is called the Heisenberg representation, is related by, through the Hamiltonian to the same operator at time 0. Have you seen this relation in quantum mechanics? You would have seen it for x or q or whatever for your generalized coordinates, but exactly the same relation should be true for fields. This is true if h is independent of Yes, which it is. Now, how would we compute this in our case? Well, of course, phi is expressed in terms of these variables, these are expressed in terms of a and a dagger. And it's only in terms of A and A dagger that H is very simple. Hmm. So let's find the time evolution of A and A dagger. Then we plug it in and we know the time evolution of phi. So this part of the discussion is time evolution. So let's notice that A k of t is e to the i h t a k. What I am going to do now, contrary to what I have been doing up to now, is that if I don't write any argument, then this is a k at 0. Okay? And then uh, this is a k at t. So the relation between the two is by this. And the same relation holds for a k dagger. Now we are in a position to calculate this. Because h is just integral d3k So how will you calculate such a thing? given that we know h and we know the commutation relations of a with a dagger. Is it right away? Huh? Expand it. Yes. Of course, you will get infinitely many terms, but you will be able to organize them and you will only need one basic relation, which is what is the commutator of h with a particular a k and what is the commutator of h with a particular a k dagger. If I expand this and this, then I will be able to rewrite this in terms of multiple nested commutators. <coughs> but for that, I need to know what is a single commutator and all the multiple ones then will become simple. So H with A, if you do this, let us do it. So it is this which has to commute with this, right? A dagger with minus K and A with K picks up. 2 pi q delta, okay. The integral eats up the delta, this eats up the 2 pi q, and a dagger with a is minus. Hmm? So the answer is minus omega k is minus omega k. While this one is plus omega k, 
No, no, I've said H bar to 1 actually. One minute, one minute. There's one grand moment in my notes where H bar becomes 1. I don't remember where it was. Ah, henceforth in these lectures we work in units in which H bar equals 1. That comment should have been made before I started the normalization discussion. Hmm? Good. <coughs> okay. So this is this. And plugging this into the exponential, it's quite easy to show, but that I'm not going to show here, that this one is e to the minus i omega k t a k and this is equal to e to the plus i omega k t and now we finally get a very very nice expression if you have been writing down what I did few minutes back you would have the expression phi of uh, <coughs> let's say so let's let's find out phi of 0 and x this was integral d3k to pi cubed 1 over root 2 omega k ak this expression I wrote earlier in fact it was phi of t and x and these are all ak of t but let them, let's uh, choose t to be 0 throughout. Okay, so then this is phi of 0 and x, and this is a k at 0 and a dagger k at 0. Okay, this much is true. And now I have the new information that phi of t and x <coughs> is explicitly e to the i h t phi of 0 and x e to the minus i h t. So I act with these from both sides on the right side, but now I can use these relations because e to the i h t and e to the minus i h t when they act on both sides of A, then it's this relation and the answer is that. Hmm. Likewise for the second term, so I get So now a k acquires e to the minus i omega k t and e to the i k dot x and a dagger acquires e to the plus i omega k t and e to the minus i k dot x. Hmm. Now as per my conventions which were corrected right in my first lecture and maybe in the tutorials also uh, the vector k mu upper is k 0 and k therefore it's equal to sorry so therefore sorry the vector k mu upper yeah is k 0 and k therefore the vector with k mu lower for vector k mu layer lower is k 0 and minus k while x mu is of course always upper and it is t and x. With these facts, this whole thing assembles into e to the minus i k mu x mu for vector contraction. So let's write that. So I am using k dot x when I don't put a vector arrow it means it is a 4 vector and k dot x is k mu x mu so it is k 0 times t k 0 is omega k so it is omega k times t minus k dot x ok uh, and therefore it is the same as what's up there <coughs> when I put omega
omega kt i get e to the minus i omega kt which is the correct time evolution of a and the other term i get plus because this minus and this minus cancel so i get plus i k 3 vector dot x which is correct in the first term and then of course the second term is easy and now finally we've got our field in the form that is most useful this is the general expansion of a free klein gordon field indicating its time and space dependence completely i think to make the measure also look very boring so we can find the bkes yeah actually i want that square root to just a two omega ah but uh, wait ah probably we oh thank you so right now what is happening is no, the no. moment the ah. kit is ah. not just an ak acting on back home yeah. there some other factor that is correct i agree you are quite right and in fact i think what i should do is to redefine my ak so that they have the uh, 2 omega k in their commutator because then also the one particle state automatically gets normalized hmm. good okay these are things you can discuss in the uh, tutorial if need be i'll keep this only because uh, peskin and shoders book uses it in this form uh, <coughs> the important part for us is that these factors are now manifestly lorentz invariant e to the minus i k dot x and e to the i k dot x okay now let's notice something in the very first lecture when i talked about expanding when i talked about phi of tx being possibly a wave function when we wrote the klein gordon equation as a wave equation then these were the solutions right e to the minus i k mu x mu r e to the plus and one of those two was a negative energy solution that was the thing that was worrying us at that time okay so they are still there if you want you can call this to be a positive frequency mode why because if i act with i del by del t then what comes down is omega k with a plus sign right and this one you can call a negative frequency mode because if i act with i del by del t then omega k comes with a minus sign but that doesn't mean that these correspond to positive and negative energies instead of that we see the following lesson that the destruction operator ak multiplies positive frequency modes while the creation operator ak dagger multiplies <coughs> negative frequency modes so it's something to remember whenever you see e to the minus i k dot x and e to the plus i k dot x the first thing you remember is this must be a positive frequency mode this must be a negative frequency mode and the difference between them is that the destruction operator appears with this and the creation operator appears with that okay but the states of the system which we have already calculated all have positive energy so it's not that <coughs> there's any negative energy in the system but that in the mode expansion of phi there are positive and negative frequencies one more thing to notice is that in this final form it's very transparent that phi is the operator associated to a elementary particle okay we haven't stressed the particle interpretation but now we can do that basically what is it it's made of two parts a positive frequency and negative frequency part so all fields are made of two parts okay in one part we have the ability to destroy a particle from a state so if this acts on the state containing that particle it will destroy that particle the other part of the field has the ability to create a particle okay so the single field contains within it both the ability to destroy a particle and ability to create a particle so quantum states of the system 
which are obtained by acting with the field on other states are basically states with one less or one more particle. It changes the field is something which changes the number of particles. Okay. However, notice one more point which is amusing. This field doesn't have a definite particle number because one part destroys and one part creates a particle. Hmm? So there's no definite particle number. Now let's see something very very simple which arises if we simply convert phi to a complex field. So that means that phi star is not equal to phi. Okay. Now we can't use this because if you remember all our machinery started by saying phi is an expansion in modes qk and then qk dagger is q of minus k. All that was assuming phi was real. So in order to do this case, we have to go through everything from the start. It's a very good exercise. I am not trying to pile up exercises for the tutorial. Actually, I feel that many of these exercises you should do either on your own here or on your own after you go home. Because after all, I am only teaching a 12 lecture course on field theory, not a substitute for the whole subject. So these are things you should make a note of and check them on your own maybe after the school. So <clears throat> what is the thing I am referring to that we assume phi star is not phi. We start everything from scratch and come all the way and arrive at an expression analogous to this. What do we actually find? So I will write for you the answer and this is what you can convince yourself that phi of p and x Now it is BK e to the minus i k dot x plus a k dagger e to the i k dot x while phi dagger all this stuff is the same. So you see that instead of one set of oscillators A and A dagger, I now have two sets of oscillators A and A dagger and B and B dagger. Okay? That's one thing. The com commutation relations are A with A dagger as before, B with B dagger just as before but for some new oscillators and A with B or A with B dagger all those commutators are zero. They are unrelated sets. Hmm. Now let's try to understand what this means. We already saw over there that this creates a particle and this destroys the same particle. Okay. However, here this creates a particle and this destroys a different particle. B is corresponds to a different particle. Hmm. This one creates that different particle and destroys the original or destroys the original particle. Okay. Now what kind of interpretation can we give to, to this? So, we will see in a couple of lectures, maybe three, uh, you see we haven't been able to discuss concepts like electric charge yet. Why? Because one important field is missing from our discussion that is the electromagnetic field. We still don't have technology to discuss the electromagnetic field. But we will see that a charge can be associated with complex fields phi, phi star such 
such that this field has a charge let's say plus 1 and 5 dagger has the opposite charge minus 1. So the electric charge changes sign under complex conjugation. In the light of that, if you look at this, you will see that this creates a particle of charge plus 1, but this, this one here creates a particle of charge minus 1 hmm? because phi dagger is associated to charge minus 1. So we learn that when you have a complex field then you have particles of some charge as well as particles of the opposite charge. Not only that, now look at the first line, this creates the particle of charge plus 1, this destroys the particle of charge minus 1. In both cases, what happens to the net charge of the state? It increases by plus 1 in both cases. That's consistent with the fact that this has a charge of plus 1. Both its terms therefore must create a change which adds a charge of 1 unit. Both these terms create a change which takes a, adds a charge of minus 1 unit. This by creating that particle and this by destroying the original particle. Okay. And with this picture it's quite clear that B, B dagger describes antiparticles relative to A, A dagger. Which one you call particle and which one you call antiparticle is up to you. But whichever you choose, let's say A and A dagger is associated to a particle of some charge, then B and B dagger are this, uh, related to a particle of the opposite charge but the same spin, the same mass. Actually it turns out the same everything else except charge. Hmm? So the name antiparticle is really because they have everything same except their charges. So they are like some kind of mirror image of the original particle. But please, please note because I think this impression is wide, widespread these antiparticles don't have negative mass, negative energy, they don't travel backward in time. They are perfectly good normal particles just like the original particles. Hmm? They don't do anything shady. In fact, you can see that in this expression, there is nothing particular to distinguish the particle from the antiparticle. I can rename phi as phi dagger and phi dagger as phi and the role of particle and antiparticle gets flipped. And in fact, in the physics of our universe, the only reason to call our things particles is that there are more of them. If there were more of the other ones, we would call those as particles. Hmm. So, yes. What the word charge means? Yeah. So the word charge. Uh, so that's why I wrote. We will see the word charge actually doesn't mean anything in this theory, hmm. but it will. Okay. The, okay. There are two ways to understand charge. One is that there is a conserved quantum number in this theory that I'll show you either probably tomorrow. The other is that it is the way in which this field couples to the electromagnetic field. Okay, Since we haven't introduced an electromagnetic field yet, we can't discuss that meaning of charge. Be patient, I will come to it either today or tomorrow, we will see. So now I want to talk a little bit about propagators. And this has two purposes. One of course that is something physical that can happen even in free field theory. That is a particle can propagate from one time to a future time. Okay? But of course it can't interact but it can propagate. In fact, must propagate. Okay? Uh, the second thing is it tests a feature which is our ability to compute expectation values. There is not much fun in computing the expectation value in the vacuum of phi, what will we get if we try to do this? What will we get? How many people think it's zero? How many people don't think it's zero? Okay, it is zero because phi is a and a dagger, a annihilates to the right and a dagger annihilates to the left. Okay, so if I put this in between 0 and 0, I get 0. So this, in a free field theory, this is not very interesting. This could be interesting in an interacting theory, but it's not interesting in free field theory. So what's the next most interesting thing? Is 0, phi of x, x0, and x. That you agree? Just breaking up the four vector in which time and space component. Okay. 
Now, this, when it acts on the right, it creates a particle from the vacuum. Right? Because phi has two pieces. Uh, now I am back to real fields, by the way. You can forget about the complex ones. Phi has two pieces. One destroys, but that one, when acting on the vacuum, doesn't give anything. It gives me zero. Because it contains A. The other piece of phi is A dagger. That one acts and creates a particle. Okay? This one, on the left, it gives me zero if this had A dagger. So this only contributes with A, which destroys the particle. So now you see the physical process. Vacuum, one particle is created, then that particle is destroyed, and we are back in the vacuum. So it's that amplitude for that to happen. Hmm? That's why we call it a propagator. Something pops out of the vacuum, propagates, and then gets destroyed. So creation occurs at Y naught. Yes. Destruction occurs at X naught. Right. Then it's not actually greater exactly than my point. So that's what I was. You just took the words out of my mouth. This interpretation is very nice as long as x naught is a later time than y naught. Hmm. But it's very mysterious to understand what is this thing where x naught is an earlier time than y naught because then this describes something which is created later and then destroyed earlier. Hmm. So this is a bit puzzling. So this is natural if x naught is greater than y naught. Okay. If x naught was less than y naught, it would be more natural to compute the product in the reverse order. Remember, these two things don't commute with each other because these are full of a's and a daggers. So phi at, at x and phi at y don't commute with each other in general. Hmm. So if x naught was less than y naught, it would be more natural to calculate zero phi at y phi at x zero. Because then this would describe a particle created at the space point x at time x naught and then destroyed at the space point y at time y naught. This motivates us to define a particular product like this. I will call it bf of x and y and I will tell you what the interpretation is. First I take 0 phi in the first order, phi x, phi y, 0 and I multiply it by a function which imposes that x naught is greater than y naught, the theta function, the step function. Do you know step function? Hmm? If x naught is greater than y naught, then theta is 1. If x naught is less than y naught, then theta is 0. Okay? To this, let me add the reverse thing theta of y naught minus x naught, 0, phi of y. And my claim is this is the thing which actually you should study in order to study particle propagation. Not this by itself, nor the reverse one by itself, but the one in which the leftmost operator is at a later time than the rightmost operator. This is guaranteed by these things because here if x0 is a later time then this is the answer to the left side but if x0 is an earlier time then this doesn't contribute but this contributes which is what we want. So both ways we always make sure that the time of the guy on the left is later than the time of the guy on the right and this therefore has a very nice simple representation we introduce a symbol t It's just a definition. The symbol t, when acting on phi of x, phi of y, puts them in this order if x0 is greater than y0 and puts them in this order if it's the other way around, making sure that therefore inside this, whatever is the value of x0 and y0, the later one comes on the left. See, the point is we cannot guarantee that what is the value of x0 and y0 because we want this quantity for all possible x0 and y0. And the time ordering makes sure that the later one is always on the left. So T is called time order product.
and this is something we can calculate. <coughs> Couple of more things, this is, this F stands for Feynman, it's called the Feynman propagator. df. Now one last thing, there is a symmetry in this theory which tells me that df of two variables x and y, these are two four vectors, actually depends only on the difference x minus y. What is the reason for that? Yeah, you are not supposed to answer to the students, but it's okay. Yeah, translation invariance, is that clear? What does it mean physically? Just think about the situation. It's a free field theory in a flat infinite universe. Hmm. Any point of that universe is equivalent to any other point. If I subtract the same four vector from both of them, move the whole system to another place. Hmm. So therefore it can only depend on the difference between x and y. So therefore df is a function only of x minus y. This means x mu minus y mu. Hmm? Clear? It has to be like that. So therefore when we calculate it, we should find that it comes out like that. If it doesn't come out like that, then something is wrong. Yeah. So therefore that's correct. So in other words, I can always compute correct. I can compute this for any, uh, I can compute this quantity. Hmm? But it doesn't have a good physical interpretation if this is before this. Okay? Now, practically that means that there are several different things I can compute. I can compute this product when this is later than this, this product when this is earlier than this, and the reverse. So I can make different combinations out of them which are names like retarded propagator, advanced propagator, Feynman propagator and so on. Turns out the one which is useful for us is the Feynman propagator. Now actually, I have just given a definition saying that it would be more natural, hmm. but that is fine, so that encourages us to calculate it, but later on, uh, we will see that this is a tool, that this propagator is a tool to actually calculate the things we want to know. So it is not just that it is something very natural, but being natural it will be a tool to calculate stuff. It is quite an amusing the answer itself requires quite a few amusing things to be spelt out, like controls and so on. So I better first write it. So the first nice thing is that it's an integral over all of d for k. So here k0, k1, k2, k3 are all treated as independent. Then it is i upon k square minus m square e to the minus i k dot x minus y and finally the integral is over a particular contour. So let us try to understand this expression and tomorrow we will give the derivation. Okay. It has the right property, it is a function only of x minus y because of that. Okay. I have to specify for you what is Cf, it is the contour over which this thing is integrated and the contour is in K0. Basically what will happen is that our, you see this is a expression with a pole. So let us write out this expression. It is K0 squared minus k vector squared minus m squared. So it has a pole at k naught equals plus and minus square root of k squared plus m squared which is the same as plus and minus omega k. So here just to be very clear you should always think of omega k as the value square root of k squared plus m squared, but k naught could be an arbitrary integration variable which only when this thing is 0 becomes equal to plus or minus omega k. This in some sense you know because this is the quantity which is 0 for a normal propagating particle, classical particle, right? k mu k mu is m squared. What we see here is that 
the propagator is an integral over all possible k's, not only those satisfying k squared minus m squared. But the poles of this are located at those k's which are equal to plus and minus omega k. And now I need to give a prescription <coughs> how to go around the pole which will tell you how to evaluate the propagator. So let's draw the pole. So here is k0, real k0. Here is imaginary k0. And the poles are here and here. So this is minus omega k and this is omega k. And the Feynman propagator prescription is to come along this, go below this, go like this, go above this and go to infinity. <coughs> this is CF. And what we will see is that this property of going below this and above this is what induces the time ordering. If it would go above this and above this, it would be a different ordering. If it would go below both, it would be different ordering. If it would go above this and below this, it would be anti-time ordering. That means time ordering the in the reverse way. Which apart from a convention is equally good. But if the important thing is to get time ordering, you must go once below and once above. Now I don't know if there is enough time to show how this helps us evaluate it. Uh, but let's make a start. So how do we try to evaluate contour integrals? We try to close such a contour either in the upper or lower half plane, okay, hoping that the contribution at infinity is nothing, then the integral over the contour, open contour is the same as the integral over the closed contour, but when it's closed then we use Cauchy's theorem and pick up the residue at the pole. So this contour can be closed in the lower half plane lower half plane if what condition is satisfied look at this is the contour for k0 so what is the condition x0 greater than y0 because if x0 greater than y0 then this is positive if I take this to be negative imaginary, then imaginary times this imaginary gives me a minus and a minus and a minus, three minuses. So I get e to the minus of x0 minus y0, which damps off at infinity. So it can be closed in the lower half plane if x0 is greater than y0, and in the upper half plane if y0 is greater than x0. Is that clear? I hope it's clear what we mean by can be closed. Can be closed means that the rest of the integral damps off in that region of the complex plane rapidly. So by closing it, I get something which is equivalent to the open contour. That means all this stuff just contributes zero to the answer. So I add it back to this contour and the whole contour now I can shrink until it pinches only one pole, it misses this pole because of this prescription. If it had gone over this, it would have captured both poles and would have given me something else. Okay, so therefore if x not greater than y not, and we do close it in the lower half plane, then we need to uh, evaluate what is the residue. But of course this thing, i upon k squared minus m squared is equal to i upon k naught minus omega k uh, what is it plus or minus minus i upon k naught plus omega k divided by 2 omega k now this pole is of no interest to me, 
k naught at minus omega k because it's not being caught by this contour. Only this pole is interesting. So this pole just gives me 2 pi i. So I get minus 2 pi upon so actually minus yeah. So I simply get minus 2 pi upon 2 omega k. So from here i, then 2 pi i from evaluating the control integral. So that's minus 2 pi and then this. And I just have to put that in there. So df is equal to integral d3 k over 2 pi cubed. dk0 is done. Uh, 1 over 2 omega k and then e to the minus i omega k uh, that's done also well so it still be there now yeah. so it's e to the minus i uh, k dot x minus y where now k naught is omega k You see the difference in this there's a four integral, so k naught is an arbitrary in independent variable, but we've done one of the integrations and that integration has set k naught equals omega. So this is the answer. So this is df <coughs> when x naught is greater than y naught, and when x naught is less than y naught, you will just get this with an opposite sign of here. So all we need to do in order to show that this is the correct answer, in order to supply the proof is to show that this is what we want. This for x naught greater than y naught and reverse for y naught greater than x naught. So what happens when y naught is greater than x naught? Then we pick up this pole. Okay, first of all we have to close the contour up. This pole doesn't contribute, this pole contributes that comes from the second term. So this time we get a plus. What happened to my minus sign by the way? I think this is a minus term. So there we will get a plus and k naught will be simply evaluated at minus omega k. So let's summarize the answer like this. x naught greater than y naught is this and for x naught less than y naught df is equal to uh, yes first term will have a sign first term will have a closing the contour in the lower half plane will ah. be minus 2 by i and there is an i already in the numerator that will make it plus yeah why will it be ah ok correct correct, correct correct you are quite correct you are quite correct thank you because the contour is going clockwise 2 pi i is when it goes anti clockwise Okay, but in the other term, I close it in the upper half plane, so it is plus 2 pi i. So both terms are plus, is that right? That's possible. oscillators, commute them, some of the terms are 0, whatever is left should give you this. Then that will complete the proof, but I will just uh, complete it next time. So I will stop now just with one comment. 
that the reason why the Feynman propagator is important is that it's a basic ingredient in how we understand interactions. And the idea is very simple, can be stated in few lines. Supposing a theory is weakly interacting, then on average, particles will interact with each other once in a while. Okay, and the more times they interact with each other, the weaker will be, the lower will be the probability. So, we have a mental picture that a particle propagates freely, then it interacts, then it again propagates freely, then it interacts at another place, propagates freely. So, the whole process of interaction is reduced to free propagation with point interactions once in a while. Okay. So, in between any two interactions, the particle propagates freely and that is the job of the Feynman propagator. That means, when we go to calculate something like a scattering amplitude, it will be built up out of contact interactions where the particles meet and then regions where the particles travel freely. We haven't yet done the interaction part, but in some sense by doing this we have done the free propagation. So this will be called perturbation theory. It's an approximation to study uh, scattering or interaction processes in field theories where the interaction strength is small which is true for example in electrodynamics. So we will do more on this next time.